A little bit of background on Scott before we jump in. Um, currently live in San Diego, is that right? Okay. Uh, graduated from uh, U University of Massachusetts, studied medical engineering. Um, first job out of college, consultant for Booz Allen, if that's right. Um, board of director at Team Rubicon out of Los Angeles. You spent some time up in San Francisco on the board and lead investor for San Francisco Football Club. Yeah, soccer team in San Francisco. Soccer team in San Francisco. I've always lived here, but I sort of split time there as well. Sort of split time there, got it. Um, managing partner at Mixture Ventures, which is an investment fund geared toward social good. Yeah, it's a $2 million angel fund essentially that myself and my father-in-law actually manage. Um, we focus on uh, technologies, uh, social good startups, more or less. That nice. looks sort of like um, classy in a way, um, balancing the social mission with uh, for-profit. Got it. Selected as top 40 young leaders under 40 years old by San Diego Magazine in 2009, top five most promising social entrepreneurs in America in 2011. Most recently, congratulations by the way, made it to the list of entrepreneurs brilliant 100 companies for 2016. So we're lucky to have you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, before we, we, we jump into what you're doing now, I thought maybe we could go back and get a little bit more information that I can't find online. Maybe, uh, are you originally from San Diego? Um, how did you get out here? Maybe you can talk yeah, a little bit about that. Totally. Um, first of all, I wasn't a medical uh, engineer because that makes me sound smarter than I actually am. Um, I was an industrial engineer. That's fine. Okay. That's like the <laughs> fake engineering. <laughs> Got it. Make sure everyone's clear. Um, yeah, I actually grew up in a town outside of Boston, um, and right when I graduated at UMass Amherst, literally the next day, myself, my brother, and my dad got in a car, and we drove across country. And I had two friends that were out in San Diego living in Ocean Beach, uh, and they said, you know, the grass is greener out here. So uh, I bit and basically moved out, and uh, we lived on urine cable. I walked down to get my first uh, meal in San Diego, and it was a place called Casanova's Pizza at the time. They had just opened and they were advertising for Boston pizza. Whatever that is. <laughs> uh, and so I was like, hey, I'm from Boston. I literally just arrived from Boston. Can I have a slice of pizza? The guy was cool and he was talking about expanding his business, whatever. And so I went back and got my resume and actually handed it to him. I was like, can I, can I work here for a while? And he's like, you're a little overqualified, even as an industrial engineer. And, uh, and I said, yeah, this is exactly what I want. You know? And so I actually helped him for three months just basically figuring out the pizza business, learning how to make a pie and mm. throw it and all that stuff. And we used to bring slices to the bars around Ocean Beach and then eventually beyond that, try to branch out and all these things. So I actually learned a lot um, about starting a business from scratch from the pizza shop. And then uh, actually a guy walked in one day and he was from Booz Allen and we struck up a conversation and that's how I got an interview to Booz Allen. So I didn't move out to work for Booz Allen, I moved out to do nothing and landed at a pizza shop. <laughs> Then got a job at Booz Allen, worked there for three years. And I ended up moving to Mission Beach and lived with a few additional friends who moved out from Boston because we told them the grass was greener and they ended up there. And none of them had jobs. And so we were basically brainstorming. I was the only one with a job. I had to wear a suit to work every day. I still think about that. It was horrible. Uh, anyways, we were brainstorming how we could um, get involved with the local chapter of the American Cancer Society because my mom had, had cancer growing up. Um, she battled uh, cancer and radiation, chemo for five years straight. And, uh, my buddy Pete, his dad, unfortunately, had passed away from cancer. And everyone, we realized everyone in the house sort of had the same, a similar type of story. We we're also new to San Diego, and we wanted to sort of branch out and do a social event and make it charitable and whatnot. And then really, that was it. That was our idea. Uh, and the movie Anchorman happened to be on in the background at our apartment when we were thinking about what the event would be. We decided that it should be a pub crawl down Garnett Street in Pacific Beach. And you know, in the movie Anchorman, he says, you stay classy San Diego. My buddy Pete turned to me and said, well, why don't we name this pub crawl the Stay Classy Pub Crawl? Never thinking in a million years it would actually turn into anything legitimate. And so that's where the actual name of Classy came from, this pub, charitable pub crawl named after Will Ferrell in the movie Anchor. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we did exactly that. We basically had this pub crawl. We invited 1,000 people. Um, or I'm sorry, we well, probably invited 1,000 people. 75 people showed up. We raised $1,000. <laughs> and... Um, and after I had this check, I remember like cash, and we, we basically had this like thing from the bank, and I called the American Cancer Society from my office at Booz Allen and was like, hey guys, we, made, we raised this thousand dollars for you, like we did this pub crawl after Will Ferrell, and they were like, what did you do? Like they actually got kind of mad and pushed back, and I'm like, you're not supposed to do fundraising outside of sanctioned events. What the hell? Are you serious? Like you don't want this money? And um, they're like, yeah, well we want your money, but you gotta come to this sanctioned event down in Point Loma, it's called the Relay for Life. No idea what that was. 
So myself and 22, two or three 23 year olds show up at the Relay for Life and it was a thousand, a thousand women walking around the track for 24 hours straight. And so we show up with this check and we basically get in line and start walking around the track. And eventually, like after four laps, we hand him the check. We're like, let's get the hell out of here. Um, <laughs> anyways, the point of the story is it was really freaking hard to get full with this organization. They clearly weren't um, sort of resonating um, with us. And, um, you know, I consider myself like a tip of the spear millennial. I'm sort of on the border. Um, but we were thinking about things differently even, even back then. And um, that, that experience inspired us to do... Uh, many, many different fundraising events throughout the next four years. Mm-hmm. We, we didn't, weren't even thinking technology at the time, actually. Um, we, we saw the problem as, like, how do you get young people involved in philanthropy? So it was literally completely mission-driven. It had nothing to do with making money, nothing to do with technology. It was literally about how do you start a movement in San Diego, get young people involved in charitable causes. So we broke outside of the, um, cancer as a cause. We kept, kept that to some degree, but we branched out and did environmental and et cetera, et cetera. And we would pick a tangible project in the community in San Diego. Um, we cleaned beaches with Surfrider. We, you know, we restored a wing of a homeless shelter for San Diego Youth Services. But everything was fun. Like we, it was all through an event and it was all fun. And we tried to try to like be really transparent about the impact that people were creating with the dollars that they were generating. Actually, some of them here we were talking earlier was actually at the earlier events. It was all under the State Classy brand. It was all about getting young people together. But eventually, we outgrew the technology that we were using to take the registrations to the events and actually make and have our participants make the donations to these organizations. Uh, we were using like Evite for the invites, uh, MySpace and PayPal to promote the event, uh, and PayPal, or did I say that? And e- Evite and PayPal, and MySpace, whatever. It was crappy. And so when the events grew to the size, like literally one event was 5,000 people. It was called the Elemental Experience. It was in Mission Bay. Um, it was a huge music concert with Modest Yahoo as the headliner and Mason Jennings and Bass Nectar. Uh, because of that concert, they banned events in that spot. I apologize for that. Um, but we raised a ton of money. Uh, and we used actually, before that event, we, we hired a developer off of Craigslist, literally, who became the co-f- technical co-founder of Classy. He built the alpha version of Classy for that event. So we raised more money than ever, and what it did was allow people to basically purchase a ticket, create a personal fundraising page, share it on the early versions of social media, MySpace, Facebook, whatever, and raise money from their family and friends. So it was an er- we basically stumbled into a very early version of peer-to-peer fundraising or crowdfunding, like before that was even a thing. And it was the nonprofit beneficiaries, people were raising money for that said, hey, like, this is pretty awesome what you guys just did. Uh, can we use that for our other campaigns and events throughout the years? Because this could really help. This could really help us. Um, and some of them were also using some really crappy solution from this company called Blackbaud, which was, turns out, they were sort of the, the big gorilla in the space yep. and sitting on the, non, the nonprofit technology throne for decades, literally since 1981. That was their founding when I was born. Very much unchallenged. And so we started to do our research and we're like, yeah, I think, you know, we, we like to say we naively, ambitiously threw our hat in the ring. Um, we thought that the lack of options was um, detrimental to the sector. Um, we thought that nonprofits were, especially smaller ones, were having trouble breaking through that million dollar revenue scale um, sort of point, um, largely because of technology and access to funding. And we thought we could play a big role in that. So could our jobs, went through the springboard program at UCSD, the incubator. Um, our advisor, Steve Smith, plus his heart, right, gave us our first $100,000. Uh, we rebuilt the app from scratch and relaunched in January 2011. So it's a long-winded story. but. Uh, basically, the journey's been going since 2005, 2006 time frame. It wasn't even a technology company. Right. So it took four or five years to even get to the launch of Classy, as we're known today, as a SaaS company for fundraising. So it was all of that. Like, I think it's funny because I, I have this chart that sometimes when I do this presentation, it's like what success looks like, whatever. And it's like TechCrunch throws out an article, and it's like like you came out of nowhere, right? It's like there's usually about five to seven years before that point. <laughs> right. Article, and then you got five to seven more years before you do anything meaningful, too. So I think for us, it's been a very long journey. But as a technology company, we've been around for about five and a half years. Got it. Um, that's interesting. So going, going back a little bit, so thanks for that. Um, a defining moment, I mean, you, you talked a lot about kind of how class you came to be, but I mean, a little bit more about yourself. Um, where, you know, growing up or coming out here where there's things in your lives. I mean, was this really the first sort of project or endeavor you sort of took off with? Or were there, were there things that you had done prior that sort of, you know, got you to this point? Yeah, no, this was, this was definitely my first rodeo. Um, and it was, it was, I always knew that someday I might do something entrepreneurial, but I wasn't seeking it. I wasn't really sitting around trying to brainstorm an idea. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, I think I'm somewhat of the type of person that will take the challenge in front of me and try to just make that the best it can be. And so at Booz Down, I was actually having a great time. I, yes. you know, it wasn't the most glamorous of jobs, but I, was, I, I dug in and was excited about my trajectory there. And this just happened to come about. I mean, we really, um, you know, honestly, like, we were not thinking about this as a business for years. Right. Uh, and then eventually when we started to see the opportunity, you know, I give us credit for, see, for, for identifying that and, 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 you know, putting the chips on the table. But um, it wasn't until we worked with the nonprofits very closely in the trenches doing these events that we realized that uh, the technology that we're using was so outdated. And then we were forced to essentially build our own tech for this purpose. Uh, and then, you know, from there we realized that we could open it up to any nonprofit. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that uh, it came about that way. I know a lot of young companies and startups, you know, they're looking for their, their traction opportunities. I mean, for you, it was the events you just mentioned. It was working closely with the nonprofits. Were there other things that you guys needed to do before you really started digging in and developing the tech and, you know, really blowing this open? Or The first two, so 2011, uh, it wasn't like it was a magical sort of hockey stick from there either. I mean, it was another two years before we really even saw a lot of traction, to be honest. It was probably five people, five, ten people for a long time, a couple of years. And, you know, I think I like to say we had an identity crisis in the beginning. We were trying to figure out sort of where we fit into the market. And we were basically a crowdfunding platform, more or less. But we didn't know if we wanted to be GoFundMe or like an Indiegogo or if we wanted to be what we are today, which is essentially a B2B to C uh, white labeled fundraising platform that the organization's brand is sort of in the forefront. We're sort of like a WordPress is to a blog. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the GoFundMe side, like you're going clearly to a GoFundMe site, it's branded GoFundMe. And so we were trying to, we actually were trying to do both. We had early competitors that actually flamed out because they couldn't pick one or the other. And we decided, we, we at some point, it was probably in 2012 or so, we said, like, what are we, what can we be as like, classic book, good to great. Like, what can we be best in the world at? And it was literally like a leadership sort of offsite thing. And we said, what we know is some of the pain that the people that are, you know, these development directors that are working for nonprofits are feeling because we were basically in the trenches with them for five years. GoFundMe, you go, go Kickstarter, these guys, they don't, they don't understand it. That's what we know better than anyone. And so if we position the business and focus the business to solve that pain point, then we're in a pretty good spot. So that's basically what we did. We, we abandoned the B2C consumer side idea for, for a while. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get back to that someday. Um, and just really focused on what are the best tools for the nonprofit, for their need. Uh, and that drove us to really develop you know, the, the entire roadmap. And I think there's two like, really key product philosophies that came from that decision. One was, I said it before, but uh, their brand before ours. So putting the nonprofit's brand before ours. So everything you see in class, you probably donated um, to class like a classy powered site without knowing that we you know we were behind the scenes doing that and that's we would actually prefer that to be the case um, because the nonprofit truly cherishes that relationship with that donor and that fundraiser that's their lifeblood that's their revenue mm -hmm. you wouldn't want someone getting in between your customers and your organization it's the exact same thing and so that's actually a huge differentiator um, and then two is just like Zappos delivers remarkable customer experience um, one of our tenants was always, uh, we will deliver a remarkable supporter experience or donor experience on behalf of all of the organizations. So huge focus on the UX, the mobile, and just the end user experience. Um, and that we found that to be a huge differentiator, but we built the product like we would want to have seen it as fundraisers and supporters ourselves. We were supporters. We built for our own needs. So we built it sort of from the reverse, mm -hmm. whereas our competitors in BlackBot built it from like the administrative side and sort of the database side. We came at it from the end user side, and that ended up being a huge differentiator. Got it. Um, the incubation, um, the, the, the incubator that you went through, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know a lot of um, you know, people who may be thinking about uh, starting a business or going through and, and you know, what are the benefits of an incubator? Um, and I, I'd love to hear about um, you know, raising capital. I mean, it was, you know, congrats on the 100,000, but, uh, you know, maybe what, what was next after that, yeah. too? Totally. So, the incubator was a pretty, like, daunting thing for us, um, because we were, we were literally, like, a charity events company trying to pivot into a software company. Like, that's about as hardcore of a pivot as you get. Uh, and so, our advisors, like, had no idea what to make of us. They were, like, looking at us, like, what? Like, you're hosting concerts and you want to be a SaaS platform? Like, so actually, we, we were in Connect. We were probably like the longest term person in Connect. <laughs> like we couldn't graduate. <laughs> we were like, I don't even know what to do with you guys. Like, you're crazy. Um, but luckily, we had 
they weren't even necessarily software experts actually, but they just were like sound business folks that could help us think through like, okay, well, what's an actual business model here? And like, almost like come back to the fundamentals. I think that helped a lot. Um, instead of rushing to be like, oh, we need to look like this SaaS company or this SaaS company. They, they actually, their, this is, I don't mean to sound bad, but their lack of software experience actually helped us think through like the fundamentals of the business model and stuff. And a lot of our advisors had come from, um, frankly, like the, the um, biotech world and things like that in other, in other in financial and in other industries. Um, but that flavor, I think, helped us sort of stay objective. Um, so yeah, our first advisor is $100,000. And then it was tremendously challenging to raise money after that. No one wanted to touch the nonprofit sector with a 10-foot pole. They were like, you'll never make money there. What's that opportunity? Like, are you a nonprofit? Um, we, had a, we have a .org, actually, designation on the website. And that, that was like the a huge con in the beginning, but actually a huge pro later. Uh, but everyone thought we were a nonprofit. So we'd go to these investor meetings, and they didn't know if they were, giving it, they were getting solicited for a charitable donation or actually investment. Uh, tech stars left us out of the room. Or uh, not tech stars, sorry, uh, tech host angels. Uh, so we, we've had a lot of horror stories. Have you guys seen the um, show Silicon Valley? Yeah. Yes. They do the Sand Hill Road Shuffle. So, um, you know, besides that, like, graphic part, like, that was basically us, like, but the, like, the negative episode where everyone was laughing at us. Like, we did that early on. We tried to go there. Uh, we actually got meetings, but, you know, we got all no's. And so it's a long way of saying, basically, like, we had to scrap and claw for every, every dollar in the beginning. Uh, we raised five, we ended up raising five million dollars of just angel money. So before any VC or any institutional um, investor would touch us, we raised basically five million dollars, mainly in, in twenty five thousand dollar increments until the end. Wow! We had three main investors invest a hundred thousand dollars or so and step up and become our three lead super leading super angels. But in the beginning, like it was twenty five thousand dollar increments, and I'm sure I mean, there's a lot of people probably that, that are have started companies, and that's that's a brutal place to be. Like everyone's in that spot for a while, but we were in there for three years doing that. I mean that's. So hard to forecast, so hard to plan. Um, I had my now glad I, I'm glad I married her, but uh, she was my girlfriend at the time. She invested seventy five hundred dollars. Glad it worked out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, one of my best friends from high school invested ten thousand. I, I mean, like we took friends and family to the next level at Classy. I did every single. I mean, my 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 wedding. Like I mean, I had everyone come out to St. Louis Obispo, and they were asking me for like company updates during my wedding. I had so many people that are inv invested in this. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it's a half joke actually. It's serious. Um, so eventually, you know, we started to get traction. Traction is every startup's best friend. It's you know, it's like you, you have numbers, and then you start to. So luckily, we were able to take this money and turn it into something. It still took us a while, like I was saying. But mid-2013, we realized that um, this, we, re we figured out the target of the nonprofit market that we really wanted to go after. And that was an organization with about a million to $15 million in their own revenue. So a little more sophisticated of an organization than we had been targeting before. Mm -hmm. And what we, were, we had been all transaction fee-based up until that point. So basically, a model like Indiegogo or GoFundMe, where we would just take a cut of the donation. A small cut, but a, a take. And what we did was we evolved the business model to a subscription plus an even smaller percentage of the fee of their donation. And because our customers basically told us that they, they would prefer to pay that way. Um, because overall, as they grew their, their fundraising, they, the cost would go down. It was, it, was a better, it was a better model for them. And with a subscription model, I mean we could actually invest in a sales team uh, because that made a little bit more sense. Right. And that's when things really started to take, take off. So we hired our Still, our VP of sales now, and I say still because it's very rare that a, uh, a head of sales goes from like two reps to now we have 50 AEs. Our sales team alone is 100 people. All and here in San Diego? Yes. Yeah. We have 180 folks total, and the sales team is about 100 and growing from there. So, like, she stayed, she, she came in at three people and is now leading 100 people sales team. Um, and so she's done a, you know, a phenomenal job, but it was her and I doing basically customer development in the beginning. Like, will, will nonprofits pay 500 bucks a month? I don't know. Like, let's get out there and ask. And so that, that was a huge piece, but she's, we've been able to you know, scale together, which is pretty awesome. But right around the time that we added that subscription piece was when investors started to take, the institutional investors started to take a little bit more notice. Right. Um, our first institutional dollar in was actually from Salesforce, Salesforce Ventures. Um, them, Bullpen Capital, and Venture 51, which Venture 51 is actually in San Diego. It's just telling, they moved from the Bay Area in Arizona and literally are in Encinitas, and they're like the most least known VC that's like really, really good. I'm sorry, who, who is that again? Venture 51. Venture 51? 
Anyone heard right, of that? Write that down. Yeah. Exactly. They should be here. I don't understand they, why they're not. They should. They're in a lot of gay companies. Um, but anyways, it's more recent move, but we should wrangle them over here. Um, so we got $3 million from them. It was basically a bridge to our B. And then we went on to raise uh, 15, more, 15 million more uh, as, as the full B, uh, led by um, Peter Thiel's new fund, um, uh, Mithril Capital. It's sensitive to throwing out Peter Thiel's name these days. I think he's speaking at uh, Trump's thing. But anyways, from an investment standpoint, he's been fantastic. He has founders funding as Mithril. Um, and so they were really long-range thinkers. They had a very strong conviction about the nonprofit space before. And a lot of pushback we would get is, again, like, why would you invest in this space? Um, obviously, there's the money consideration, but there's the mission-oriented piece, and they understood that as well. Um, so we were just very lucky um, to be able to find them. And that closed in March 2015. So we've raised $23 million to date and actually raising $30 million right now. So we're going to continue to scale. Um, a lot of the investment will be back in product. Um, right. We went pretty hardcore on the sales and marketing on purpose um, because we felt like there was no clear leader in the space and, and the brand and the sales and the marketing to throw a hammer down was, was important. You brought up BlackBot. I mean, is that, is that really kind of the, the only player that, that you guys saw as real competition? Yeah, we're established at least, yeah. It was BlackBot and then everyone else, mm -hmm. and it was just a massive gap. And we were starting to pull ahead. We weren't quite there. We had a lot of peers that were pretty similar, and that's why we felt like a, a pretty heavy investment in sales and marketing would push the brand to the forefront. We could become that um, that emerging leader, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's you know that's, it's worked fairly well. Uh, now on the on the counter to that, um, I think we potentially overinvested in sales and marketing, underinvested in product, because we had by far had the best product in the space, and then we sort of slipped a little bit. And now we've gotten back to a, where we need to be, but there was a period there was kind of scary like we saw people catching up to us and we're supposed to be the one that's innovating right right and so it's such a delicate balance um and you know i think we have we brought in a, a new cto he was the former cto at redfin he has been fantastic in transforming our company uh, from a technology standpoint particularly architecturally mm -hmm. setting us up for scale also he's fantastic at recruiting not only in san diego ucsd has one of the biggest computer science departments in the country that's been huge so I didn't even know that until he came and told me that, which is embarrassing, but I was literally right there. Right. So we, we built a relationship with the school, and then we also traveled to other schools and tried to pull people in. So I'd say a third of our employees come from outside of San Diego still, pulled directly to Classy, and then the rest come from San Diego. Got it. How, how many employees are you guys now? 180. And how many customers, roughly? Um, 1,200 that are in subscription and another couple thousand that are in the free, the free plan that just pays just the transaction. The free plan. So is that the model you guys you offer free and then it goes directly into the monetization? Yeah. Software as a the, service. The free plan is sort of like the legacy of the original. Right. Um, but we, we ended up turning that off and then turning it back on recently just to see what would happen. And 5% of our free plan turned into sales opportunities. So it's a feeder mm -hmm. of the pipeline, sales pipeline. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, the ones that just aren't sales ready end up transacting and making the company money, but making themselves money as well. So I, you know, I think when it didn't work early on, we didn't have the brand strength to, to push to sort of organically see the lift in the long tail. And we've admittedly done very little marketing down there still. Um, but there's a huge opportunity. Uh, but right now, it serves as essentially a lead feeder. But I think it could be a standalone a standalone product for very small organizations that aren't, they just aren't ready to sort of get into those larger plans. Right. What, um, what, what do you see is next for Classy? I mean, I mean it, it, it's a heck of a story because I've, I've had conversations with, you know, folks that have just, you know, they start out, you know, lemonade stands when they're five years old and you guys built this thing over time and then, you know, you kept going. It's, it's such a cool success story. Where do you see you guys, you know, in the next couple of years? Where do you want to take this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I lose sleep over that every night. Okay. Uh, um, no, I kind of do. But I think, you know, we, there's still, uh, I mean, I think focus is so key. And there's just such a, still a massive opportunity to add value just doing what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's 1.5 million 501c3 nonprofits in the United States alone. Uh, we've got a thousand of them. We have a long way to go. Right. And, and even our target market is a couple hundred thousand. So, I mean, we're barely scratching the surface. Um, and, you know, I feel, I truly feel like it's the first inning for the company. Um, you know, and right now we're focused on, I didn't even really touch upon this, we've, we've evolved from a peer to peer platform, peer -to -peer crowdfunding, to an all in one online fundraising platform for an organization. Um, and why I think we've sort of seen accelerated growth now, whereas there were companies that tried to compete with BlackBot 10 years ago that really didn't see success. I think the space is now ready for online fundraising. 
Uh, and what I mean by that is there's $370 billion donated to 501c3s in the United States alone, and only 9% is online still. Wow. 10 years ago, it was 1%. <laughs> so you had companies trying to do what Classy's doing, 1% online. They were convincing nonprofits that online was the future. That's a tough sell. So there's a lot of outbound pushing rather than inbound interest. And I think even in five to 10 years, you know, we timed it well, frankly, we're lucky. We came about when the, they had made up their mind that, wow, like, okay, I get it. Like, we need to start moving online. And I don't mean just experimenting with crowdfunding. I mean like moving their core operations online. So direct mail is still by far um, the biggest source of revenue. Um, one of our bigger prospects right now does $750 million in direct mail a year. And they're looking to move all that onto Classy. And so the opportunity there is, is, is absolutely astronomical. But you know, again, five, 10 years ago, they were not ready to make that leap because online technology hadn't quite mirrored or even it wasn't better uh, than the offline. And I guess what I mean by that is when you get a direct piece of solicitation in the mail, there's pictures, it's nice, it's personable, right. all these things. And the first version of online fundraising was a PayPal form. It's about in, as impersonal as it gets. So to assume a nonprofit's going to take these cherished relationships that they've been basically marketing to offline, whether it's across the table or even in the form of really pretty direct mail, and just throw it on a PayPal form is really kind of ridiculous when you're talking about, in this case, $750 million of revenue. And so it's just now that I still think we're in our infancy, but technology like Classy has sort of been able to make the offline experience move it online and even make it better. Uh, and, ho and hopefully uh, help them retain those donors and grow them over time. So it's a long way of saying basically the space wasn't ready and I don't think the technology was quite ready. Right. So a lot of our, our predecessors uh, you know, flamed out early even though they were onto something pretty awesome. Can you talk a little bit about your partnerships? I mean, you mentioned Salesforce Ventures. I know they offer an app exchange um, you know, for tech companies to come in and offer their solutions for their customers. Do you guys, are you aligned with you know, strategic partners? How, how did you guys go about finding those? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we ended up realizing that um, fundraising SaaS for a nonprofit was sort of the stack, the layer above their CRM system, their database of record. Right. So they would, they would manage all of their data and their records in Salesforce or BlackBot. And we were sort of like the thing above that that would help them take the transactions and do the engagement, sort of like the fundraising, the marketing almost. And they would use the CRM for tracking their records over time and sort of longer term donation management. And we started to realize that there was this trend of folks moving from BlackBot to Salesforce and also BlackBot to Classy on the fundraising side. Right. And so we thought that it would be advantageous to go and build a Salesforce integration so that it would the data would sync back and forth and various other things. And so we did that with, I mean, Salesforce is a very open philosophy. Their APIs are available. You can go build on it if you want. You don't have to have an official relationship with them. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. We basically invested some of our resources in building that integration. That helped us win deals. Uh, and also it helped us catch the attention of Salesforce. So first, before they invested, their um, vertical that concentrates on nonprofits and higher ed, they had like 12, 20, 12 to 20, a couple dozen people dedicated. Now they have 200. Yeah. So they've really started to invest in the space. But when we, when we started talking to them, we just had this integration. We were like, hey, guys, like, you know, um, here's what we've built, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, hey, you know, we're looking at this space. We're actually, this, you know, this might be the next billion dollar vertical for Salesforce. We're looking for partners. And so again, timing was kind of everything. Um, and basically what ended up happening was they um, asked us to go through this ISV program, which is the weird acronym for their preferred partner program for Salesforce. We applied, um, got accepted, and now their reps that sell to nonprofits actually get commission for referring, uh, referring Classy and passing over the fence to us if it closes. Right. Um, so they, their reps are incentivized. We give them a rev share, of course but it's, it's, it's well worth it. And also, you know, it's helping us move up market because they're in bigger deals. Mm -hmm. And so when we go to a bigger deal, like we just closed like Leukemia and Lymphoma Society National pretty recently. Congrats. Not a million dollars a year, wow. just that deal. And that was referred by Salesforce. And Salesforce had already won the deal essentially. And, they were, and then Leukemia and Lymphoma was like, well, what do we do with our fundraising? And they're like, classy. So they bring us into the deal. Our, pipe, our, our sales cycle is like four months when an enterprise sale like that's for us supposed to be like a year, you know? Mm -hmm. So an accelerated sales cycle, we, we ride the coattails of Salesforce and we're able to get the deal done. So we're hoping we can continue that um, uh, as we continue to move up market. Um, and, you know, Salesforce Ventures, basically the, the, the vertical, the nonprofit vertical, 
went to Salesforce Ventures and were like, you should take a look at this company. That's how the investment happened. So we didn't go to Salesforce Ventures. It was from our own essentially scrappiness with the, with the app and everything and right. doing that, that that caught the notice, uh, caught the attention of Salesforce Ventures. It's a great story. Um, I know Salesforce pretty well. Are you guys, do you see that as a repeatable model with other partnerships? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of Salesforce-like you know, yep. solutions out there. Do you guys see that? Yeah, it's an opportunity. I think long, long term, we want to be we want to be that that hub, that dashboard, essentially that hub dashboard for the nonprofit. So, yeah. uh, we want to provide like the core fundraising. The fundraising will, will probably always be our core. We're building out marketing automation, even lightweight CRM that isn't quite Salesforce complexity wise, but very lightweight for small organizations. Um, and then we want to integrate with you know best in class other tools that they're using based on their size. So one example is like QuickBooks and Intuit. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, a bazillion nonprofits use that product. And there's other like key software products that we could easily integrate with and create a channel partnership. But yeah, I think it's a I think it's a really interesting formula for success for sure. Um, I think we you know just like we stumbled into the company, we stumbled into the Salesforce relationship. And I think where I give us credit for is just under seeing the opportunity and, and la grabbing it. Do, do you see um, a, a next stumbling into of something? Are you guys working on anything right now that? might <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> become the next big thing. Usually we don't know until we're already there. Uh, exactly. Honestly. Um, you know, honestly, we keep doing what we're doing, but I think um, we're interested in, we're interested in expanding into corporate giving with corporations, so allowing corporate foundations and corporations themselves to empower, individual, to empower employees to, to give and fundraise uh, and then match them with our nonprofit clients. So that's an area that we're interested in. Longer, longer term, um, you know, when, an organiz when, a, when a person donates to say, let's just pick an organization like Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, uh, they'll get a Leukemia and Lymph Lymphoma Society profile that'll look like LS, and, but it's us powering that. Mm -hmm. and they'll be able to sign in. They can, they can, if they have a recurring gift, they can change the amount, they can change their information, they can start fundraising there, like all sorts of stuff. Um, if they donate to another organization that's powered by Classy, say it's Team Rubicon, well then we actually take the white labeling out and we create a Classy profile that combines both organizations into one. So now they're logging into Classy and we're helping them manage their giving across organizations. So long, long term, we hopefully could introduce a consumer app that would allow people to basically manage their giving across all Classy organizations and then give them information about what are the highest impact organizations in their community that they might want to get behind. So that's sort of a longer term vision. Um, but right now we have enough to do where that's sort of just pine, pine sky. It sounds like it. It sounds like it. Um, having started a business here in, in San Diego, and um, I, I do want to give uh, the folks here an opportunity to ask some questions too, but um, starting a business here, you, you mentioned the, the Sand Hill um, Shuffle. Um, what do you see for startups here in San Diego? Um, you know, there's always the talk, the Bay Area is the place to be. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's honestly a really good question. We uh, have this Quora post that I did years ago that's gotten a ton of views, but it's about this exact same thing, why we stayed in San Diego, actually, and why it can be a competitive uh, advantage. So you have that the big fish in a small pond sort of thing, so the resources and all that. Uh, but honestly, I think culturally it's a really great thing. You're not just sort of washed away with all the noise in the Bay Area. Um, you can really become part of the community. And I think that's actually like extremely underrated uh, as, a, as a, uh, a key uh, sort of element of growth um, from a hiring perspective, et cetera. So just embracing San Diego, staying in San Diego. I mean, shit, our names stay classy or classy. Like, we have to be here, right? You have to. Um, you have to stay here. Yeah, and so, <laughs> you know, people have really embraced that as like, wow, like, and, and they, they, people, I tell you, people want to move to San Diego. They I really do. And we're able to pull a third of people, new people, from other cities and from the Bay Area. Whoops. Sorry. 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 Is the Bay Area super expensive? Um, but you know, there's other, there's obviously like work life balance things, and, and there's just sort of like this speed in San Diego, which I think um, people desire. Uh, and I don't mean it's you know slow from like, and we're gonna like get outpaced by another city. I just think we have this respect for work life balance and some other things that other cities don't. Um, and we've seen fine success with carrying that forward and, and having that work life balance. So we get credit for a lot of that stuff, which we feel is sort of natural. Um, but I will say, so on the challenging side, fundraising is by far the biggest challenge, without a doubt. I mean, we, that $5 million barely even came from San Diego. So you would think we were like out in San Diego fundraising with angels, and we weren't. We, that was from like Boston, Texas, New York, San Francisco. 
So it was really difficult. And I don't want to say that you can't do that in San Diego because we were new here and we were just building our networks. So I think we were at, a dis at even more disadvantage than someone else would be. So I don't want to discourage anyone. Um, but certainly when we were starting, and when I was fundraising back in 2010, 2011, things have changed a ton in San Diego. Like Springboard was the only, only game in town. You didn't have areas like this. There was just, there was really very little entrepreneurial support at all. So I think it's a totally different ecosystem now, yeah. uh, which is much more helpful for startups, which is very <laughs> encouraging. Um, so if we did it again, like maybe we would have had an easier path to get like uh, some angel investors from San Diego, maybe a small institutional fund in early, um, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But I'd say fundraising was by far um, you know, the most challenging thing. And then you know, there really isn't a Sand Hill Road shuffle here in San Diego. No. You know, it's like the La Jolla shuffle, it's just Avalon. Right. I guess that's it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, it's, we can pretend that it's, you know, a place for institutional funders, it's not. Um, you know, there's, there's literally like a hundred on Sand Hill Road. So, I, you know, yeah. I, don't, I don't think we're even close there. So, but I do think that you can start a meaningful company here and then you need to branch out. You need to find those relationships, you need to be scrappy, you need to find how to get into those networks. And that's what I did. Like when I used to sit in the bottom of the Salesforce office in a coffee shop without meetings, I would just fly to San Diego every two weeks, literally with no meetings set up, just so I could be there. So that if someone like emailed me or called, I'd be like, oh, I happened to be in town, to like sound like I had something important going on, but I'd really be in their lobby. And when they would come down, like Matt Garrett from Salesforce Ventures, I'd meet him down in the Starbucks and just hustle like that. I mean, like literally, that's like literally how we did it. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, Salesforce, I mean, uh, San Diego entrepreneurs need to have that, like, maybe an elevated sense of uh, perseverance and grit to make it, but I think it ends up being a huge positive in the end. And I can't tell you enough, as, as finally we broke through the barrier of sort of the institutional funding, and now, you know, it's, it's not, it's hard, still hard to close money, but it's easier to get meetings these days than mm -hmm. before. Um, they will credit us being outside of the Bay Area as a huge bonus for investing. Like, they're like, I don't know what's in the water down in San Diego. It's like, well, why didn't you tell me that like five years ago? What's that all about? Uh, starting to get a good buzz and a, and, a, and a good name. GoFundMe's helped with that. We've helped with that. And others have helped with that. And I think investors are starting to look here more outside. So I think it's up to all of you and, and everyone else to, to reach out. And I think they're more willing than ever to talk, which is a good thing. I mean, that was the next question I was going to ask is what advice, I and mean, you kind of knocked it out of the park. Um, I, I get it. you, you got to put in the hustle. Um, I did have one thing. Kind of campy. If you had a chance to start over, what would be the one thing you might do differently? Probably, if I just start over. I probably would have invested in sales earlier on. Yep. Um, operationally at least. Um, I have two. One's operational and then I guess another one's more like ideological. I would have invested in sales earlier on. Um, even if it's one person outside of yourself, I think it's important and you can work with that person. And, but their, their perception of the market and how they sell is going to be different than the founder and the CEO. I don't, I'm not suggesting you step off the front line. You absolutely need to be there. But having two people do it would be a lot better than just myself. Um, so I would have done that differently. I would have started sales earlier in the process. Um, and, and hopefully that would have uh, accelerated the learning curve on that front. And then the ideology sort of side, um, we always like, because we're a social, socially, social mission sort of driven company inherently, um, I didn't feel like it was all necessary to sort of codify a lot of the uh, values and the vision and all that stuff early on. Um, and I think we went too long without kind of focusing on that because I just felt like through osmosis people were sort of get it. Uh, and they did do a large part, but then once we got to sort of like 20, 30 folks, um, you start to lose that. And like, you have the first five to 10 folk, people that just, they just live it, they breathe it, they're, they're everything. Like, they are the values. Like, if values aren't something you write on a wall. It's like how these people are living, and it's, it's really, the, it's a mirror image of them, the first five to 10 people. Um, but as you get bigger, you start to like lose the connection to the core. And then when you're 180 people, you really like, I mean, you don't know the people's names. So now it's like an extreme example, but um, really being deliberate and conscious about as you start to grow, like what were the core values of those folks? Like what did they believe? And not something you just looked up on Zappos or Amazon and said, oh, that looked, kind of looks cool. That should be our core value. Like what did the five people believe when they started this company? And being very deliberate about communicating that always and trying to connect people to the core, as we say in Classy. I'm not saying we always do it well, because we don't. 
it's very hard, um, and sometimes it feels annoying because you're just repeating yourself. Do you, you got to remember that like we have people starting every couple of weeks, they're new people. They have no idea about. They don't even know the founding story practically. Like they don't. You know more about Classy than some of the folks that start that like, will start next week, and so that's a that's a real issue. And we have to be very deliberate about making sure that they understand why we started this company, what drives us, so that hopefully they make that their own and they will want to be driven the same way. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something about core values. I mean, personally for you, I mean, what, what core values do you live by? I mean, you've, you've done a lot. And the one thing I hear from somebody in your position is settle in. This doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. I know it doesn't. Yeah. Um, what, what are some things that, that you think about when it gets tough that kind of keeps you moving? Two things. Uh, one is, or it's actually Classy's first core value, but also I would say is my personal core value, is to is stand for something. So I always want to have like a stance, like want to have an opinion. I didn't always have that when I was younger. Um, and I felt like I was influenced by others quite a bit, which, you know, it's fine as growing up. Uh, but eventually like, I kind of like realized, like, what, do I, what, what am I doing? Like, what do I stand for? Um, so I would say that that's really carried forward, and I think that classy is certainly a big piece of what I stand for. But just reminding myself, like, you know, to have an opinion, to have a voice, um, I think is really important. And, 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 you know, that is classy's number one core value, too, so I think it's tied together. Um, so I would say that that's definitely the key, uh, key one. Was I going to just say a second one, too? You said you had two. I already forgot. You could make one up if you want. <laughs> I already forgot. Maybe we do Q and A. We're gonna do Q and A. That was, we're right on right on the money, you guys. We've got about 15 minutes, um, so please, any questions that you've got for Scott, go for it. Yeah. Um, six months prior to hiring the GPSL that you mentioned, mm -hmm. what did your day to day look like? And, you know, this is in relation to you know joint sales. Yeah. So. We actually had a two-year period before we actually hired the, the VP of sales, but six months leading up was when we basically had introduced the subscription model, and it was uh, the going, the starting price was, when we tested some stuff, the, the one that we wanted to go was $500 a month, because we felt like we could build an inside sales team with those economics. So I was trying to prove that we could sell that as fast as possible. So what it looked like was myself and um, our head of, head of uh, we just called it head of business development, we were literally cold calling. I had, I had never used Salesforce in my life. I had a sticky note on like my Apple Mac, mm -hmm. and I had all the organizations listed with like a plus sign was if they responded to me, a minus was like no. <laughs> I had this like coding system on the sticky note. It's I still terrible. have it actually. It's terrible. We've closed some deals from that <laughs> list actually recently. Acumen Fund was one of them. It was on my original list. But literally, I was just hot. I mean, I was just I was selling. I was calling. I had email. I was reading books, I was reading core, I was reading, I mean, one influential book early on, um, which I'm sure uh, some of you guys have read, was um, Aaron Ross's book, P Predictable Revenue. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of SDRs and AEs, I was just really just consuming as much information as I could. But what I was, my goal was to prove that someone would find $500 worth of value in Classy. Because to me, that would convince an investor, convince our team, convince our board, uh, that we'd be able to hire VP of sales and would convince the VP of sales to actually come on because <laughs> that's actually a hard thing, right? Like they want to be, in, they're winners, like they want to win. Um, so, you know, if you don't have enough traction, um, you know, it's, it's a tough sell. So I think uh, hiring that VP of sales is extremely, extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, earlier I said I wish I had maybe started sales earlier, but I'm not, I don't know if I would have hired the VP of sales earlier. I maybe would have hired another sales rep earlier to sell along with me and waited till we had traction to get the right VP of sales. So I think that balances, you don't have to rush into that piece. And I would encourage you as a founder to, to, to be the VP of sales for a while. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't thinking of it that way, but I guess I was kind of that way. You bring up an excellent point. Um, if you go online and look up Jason Lemkin, um, he was the CEO and founder of, um, Ado of not Adobe, Echo Sign. And this was one of his big things when he started the company is you can't get the big box VP of sales to do your startup. You've got to have a sales guy for your startup and then you know, make the transition because if you get that wrong, you're going to put yourself way back. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, next question, right here. Uh, so I do sales and marketing for a nonprofit right now. I'm really marketing, not sales, <laughs> for a nonprofit now. And everything you said is so interesting. And like Hermione, I wonder if I 
<laughs> but one question I had was, uh, we talk a lot, and it's sort of a nonprofit, in the nonprofit world, it's something that comes up that's not really in the business world, is about advocacy and, you know, building, um, you know, it's a movement, building a movement yeah. for your cause. And I wondered if you saw any of what you're doing now mapping to that, because right now you're talking about fundraising and donations and money, and I wondered if there's any parallels between that and, you know, movement building. That's a really good question. Um, so I would say we're waiting and seeing what happens in the advocacy space, because, well, first of all, I'm an investor in change.org. And care too, and there's other ones that are out there, um, and they're doing a pretty decent job. It would be interesting to hear your, your opinion, but um, I think it's a natural extension of what we're doing for sure. Um, but there's uh, a lot of um, there's there's a lot of players out there that are sort of trying to do that, and so I'm not sure it's the best business move for us. Although it's a natural extension of our product, so we've talked to Ben Change and others about integrating their advocacy platforms into Classy. So if you were to run a petition or something, the leads would flow into Classy for reactivation. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of synergies there. And, and if, if the space clears up at any point in time, like I promise you we'll probably do, so, we'll do right. something well, there. Even with sales, like having the Salesforce integration and being able to put all that stuff into a CRM that you get from Google, at least people raise their hands saying, I'm interested in something online now. Yeah. And even in rooms like this, so I think there's like the petition piece, but then there's also like um, sort of lead capture and registration and, and things like that, um, online and off. And so we're, we're certainly interested in that for sure, and I think we will continue to build in that direction. But as far as like, I guess I was thinking when you said advocacy, more petition platforms and sort of that piece. Uh, but no, for sure. And, and actually, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is an advocacy platform in, 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 in and of itself. Um, every page that's created creates six new donors for the organization just because the person's tapping into their own friends network. So it's actually a huge acquisition tool, not just a uh, fundraising vehicle. So some of the tools we already offer sort of help with that, but it'd be interesting to talk to you offline about some ideas there, because I, I think we for sure would be interested. It's a great way to use Blackbox. I'm sorry, anyway, it's terrible, so. so it is terrible. There's something else out there. Yeah. Yes, right here. So clearly a key moment for your company was that transformation from being and invest non profit into a SaaS company. And I'm curious just how big your team was at that time when that kind of decision was made. And then through that process, you're getting a lot of no's and you had to have extreme perseverance to get through all the no's to the yeses. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if your team was all aligned with you, if you had challenges with getting people on board with that vision. And if you didn't, tighten a little bit. Yeah, good question. Um, the team before we were a technology company was essentially myself. Like full time was maybe two, two to three max. Uh, no one was really full time in the events days. Like we kind of were, but not really. Um, and we really we became full time in 2010, early 2010, when we realized that we were going to make that transition. It wasn't as like black and white as the story I told, but it was like around 2010 we were like, okay, like we kind of sort of move into this direction. But it took about a year to actually transition go to the incubator. So it was really like two, two to three of us, myself, my co-founder, and then a technical co-founder that built, uh, Pete, that built the uh, initial version for that event. So it was basically the three of us with some contracted help, our VP of design now, Joe Callahan, he was in the mix then, and so some other people as well. Uh, but full time it was about three of us. And then when we started, when we basically transitioned, um, we raised the first $100,000. We probably raised maybe a half a million and it allowed us to bring on some of the people that were the closest. So we probably had five people max. Um, and we were 15 people, no, no more than 15, 10 to 15 for several years until we really started to ramp. So we were basically at those pretty small levels um, for a while. I mean, it felt like an abundance of resources to us um, and uh, for, for quite a while. And when you're talking about like the alignment of the decisions, um, you know, one thing I found really challenging is you're sort of going through this like fundraising process and you're talking to all these folks and, and they're like, in the early days, they're like, if you don't succeed, like I don't have a paycheck. You know, like there's a serious direct correlation between like my success and them um, honestly being able to put food on their plate. Like we had people that were having kids at the time and it was pretty stressful. And I'll never forget some of that. Um, and you know, one, one guy was supposed to send us a $25,000 check and he didn't because his lawyers held him up and myself and my co-founder drove to LA like got in the car and drove to LA to the lawyer's office to basically settle 
settled it so that we would get the check because we had basically payroll to pay. Um, one time, the original guy that donated our invested 100000 had to come in and cut us a $31,000 check, 31000 because that was our payroll at the time. Um, so we had some serious, serious, uh, scary moments. Um, but probably the, the biggest one that, that caused like, um, us to sort of rally together was we had a term sheet for $5 million. This was when we were still had only raised about a million. So we would have sort of broken through, but I would say it was kind of like a tier three VC. So we got a ton of no's from the Sand Hills Road story. And we actually had this Canadian VC that stepped up. And they were nice guys, and like I'm not saying from Can you can't find a good Canadian VC, but um, you know, no one really knew knew about them, and it was kind of like a pretty big bet we were making. And some of our advisors sort of flagged it early, and we're like, no, we got to do this. We need the money. Like shh, we're running out of money, blah blah. blah. And so, anyways. We get to like, we're past the term sheet signing stage, which has a breakup fee. We're going through diligence, now getting towards Christmas time. We're supposed to close this deal in like the first week of January. Horrible time to close around, by the way. Um, and so I'm like taking calls from like our vacation and all this stuff and trying to get this deal done. And the last thing was like, one of the last things on our checklist was to get on the, this phone call with whoever they wanted to talk to about this thing called the Classy Awards, which we hosted, which is the largest philanthropy award show in the country now. It was like the Oscars for philanthropy. But in the early days, it looked like a really poor investment. It was like, what the hell are you doing this award show for? But for us, it was a brand exercise. It was us practicing what we preach. It was a way to get back to the community. And so literally, within five minutes of the call, we realized they were trying to sell off the Classy Awards to this, whoever this bidder was that wanted to buy it. And myself and my co-founder, Pat, we literally turned ourselves and were like, that's it. We're out. And so we basically just broke the term sheet, $5 million down the drain. And had to tell the staff and got them all together. We're like, well, we're pretty much running out of money. And so we had 30 days, and this was in 2011, or two, sorry, 2012, and uh, February 2012. And uh, has anyone heard of uh, that viral video by Invisible Children called Coney 2012? Yes. So Invisible Children, actually this old former CEO spoke to us yesterday. They, they put out that video and they were one of our earliest clients. And their goal was 500,000 views, and they got 150 million. It's the fastest video ever to get to 100 million. The ask at the end of that video was a donate button, or donate CTA, to our page. And that actually went viral when we had 30, in the 30-day window where we're going to run out of cash. We made enough cash through the Coney 2012 video to float the company to get the next $500,000 investment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we just wait a sec? Okay, now ask yeah. a question. <laughs> um, no, thanks for uh, sharing your fundraising stories and your experience there. So, um, I'm a pre launch uh, San Diego startup. I've incorporated as a B Corporation or a benefit corporation mm -hmm. and B, B, um, B Corp pending certification status. Given your experience and you know, you had shared going you know, to Sand Hill Road and, and pitching. What, what's the appetite right now in your experience for going after venture capitalist um, funds for B Corp? I don't know if everyone knows what a B Corp is, but it's, it's, a, it's a corporation that's only um, a model that is in several states in the United States. And um, it has a social, environmental, and a for-profit um, at all the same level. And so I'm just curious to see, I'm self-funded right now, and luckily my model can do that. Yep. Um, but eventually I'm going to have to go after it. Yep. Uh, traditional, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've debated this so many times internally. And we're not a big corp, although we've explored it yeah. many times. And we were almost like, I don't want to, you're never too far along to become a B Corp. I mean, ben and Jerry's is a B Corp. Yeah. Um, Change.org is a B Corp. Um, Kickstarter is a B Corp now. I mean, that's, so you're never too late to become a B Corp, and I don't want to use that as an excuse, but it becomes more complex because you have more stakeholders involved, and it's a scary thing to actually some people because they don't know how that changes the board dynamic and the incentives of the stakeholders. Um, so the best thing to do is to do that early on and cleanly, and then set the expectations moving forward of what type of investors you want at the table. I'm not saying that we have like sharks and whatever else at our table, but um, I think it's just it was there's a learning curve and an educational curve of what a B Corp is. You know, like that's new. Um, as far as raising money, I would say traditional Sand Hill Road folks um, are still um, kind of scared of the B Corp, to be honest. However, the good news is that there's more 
funds that are actually focused on B Corps and social, and social enterprises than, than ever before. I mean, literally like 10 times as many as when we were starting. In fact, one's an investor in class. I'm happy to introduce you to them um, out of New York. Um, and these folks like literally specialize in B Corps and social enterprise or hybrid business models, almost like our angel fund as well. Um, so I think that the appetite for social enterprise in general has literally 10 x in five years. But I don't think that like if you go to Santa Road and visit like I don't know Sequoia or something, then they're necessarily going to be like B Corp. Yeah, I think that there's still a, there's still a learning curve there, and I still typically try to figure out what are the implications from a risk standpoint for them, because they're serving their LPs, and their LPs want a return. And what if this does is it muddies the water of what the priorities are of the company. From their standpoint, yeah. from the CEO standpoint, from the board standpoint, it balances the fiduciary responsibility with the social mission, which is a beautiful thing. But to them, it's like, you know, does that make sense? So, long story short, I think there's a learning curve still uh, for some of those guys. But the good news is that um, a ton of new new funds have, have basically cropped up. Change.org has raised eighty million dollars in their B Corp, so it can be done for sure. Thank you. Gal, uh, do you have any uh, pressure right now from your institutional investors to have an exit strategy? Or do you see so these years they could be public or be sold? Or yep. Is it just living as a profitable kind of in the future? Yeah. The future? Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, not really, and I think it's it's so important to pick that partner that sort of is thinking in the same um, time frame as you are. Uh, that's the one thing you can control and vet pretty easily. It's, it's hard to vet the actual partner, what they're gonna be like in stressful situations, unless you like try to throw them through one as possible. Like, it's really hard to vet the partner. However, you can, you, you can ask them what the time frame of their fund is, which is basically the pressure they're gonna put on you. So Mithril has, uh, Mithril's the Peter Till fund I was talking about. They have a, actually they ask their LPs for permission to basically double the normal time frame of a, of a VC fund. So they have a double outlook on the return of each fund, which means double the essential flexibility for us to go long if we want to, without putting those external pressures on. Now, if they wanted us to sell the way that we've structured the deal, they couldn't really force a sale. But certainly, we don't want someone banging the table in every boardroom, like, you know, they sell the sales force or do whatever. Um, so I think that alignment is super important. And they're thinking five, 10 years minimum. Um, and I think for our space, that's actually pretty important because I, I do feel like we're in the first inning and it's, it's, not, easy, it's not an easy space to actually grow in um, in certain ways. And so I think there's just a long ways to go. Um, so the answer is kind of no, but I think, you know, I, I'm glad we avoided that Canadian VC and some of these other sort of uh, pitfalls that we've luckily skirted around because um, that may not be the case and it could very much be that environment in the board meeting. Um, and we've been lucky to have some of like, especially my family and friends that were invested a long time ago. Um, you know, hopefully someday they see a good exit. Uh, we definitely want an exit at some point. And I don't mean exit necessarily like we leave the company, but a financial exit for their own investors. Like that will be a very happy day for me. When, you know, I don't have to talk about my wedding, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. tangible project that people could wrap their heads around and they knew where the money was going. So what that, we, we didn't realize it, but what we were doing is basically making that, that, we call it the impact feedback loop, in classy, but we are making that whole feedback loop transparent from dollar to impact. So they knew like, oh, we're, we're donating to X and we're literally, you know, you, we, 
we're restoring the wing of the soul machine. Like, it's happening tomorrow. Here are the plan. Like, here are the schematics. And certain nonprofits do that really well, like Charity Water. Um, they'll actually, like, when you donate, the, the donation will get pinned to a specific well that they're going to drill into a specific country. They'll have a GPS on the well. You'll actually be able to see when the project starts, where it's at, its phase. So it's extremely transparent. And I think that's sort of the next generation of getting people motivated to, to, to donate or continue to donate, especially. Uh, it's easy to donate on emotion. To do sometimes donations can be emotional. That's fine. But how does an organization keep that person involved over time? And I think that's where the transparency and the accountability um, comes to play. And I think there's a lot of skepticism now because of, you know, anyone from, you know, sort of, well, Livestrong and sort of that stuff, even though the charity is fine. Um, but lots of other animal organizations recently, like all these different things where you get these horrific stories in the Wall Street Journal, Summer Post, or, or you know, Anderson Cooper on CNN, and you know, these charity thing, watchdog report yeah. things. And, it just paints this picture that these guys are all out to take our money and you know, run with it, which is so far from the truth. I mean, so much innovation is actually happening in the nonprofit sector that people don't give it credit for. And I think the miss is that um, the organizations aren't doing a good enough job of sort of you know, pounding their chest and saying, here's what we're doing, communicating it. And not only communicate, but in a, in a way that people can understand. Sometimes they do it out of emotion and storytelling and less quantitatively. I don't think one replaces the other, but what we're trying to do is teach our organizations how to tell the story of their impact quantitatively so people can understand, like, okay, well, I'm addressing this social problem, um, and here's the metrics by which I measure myself. Here's the metrics by which, I, which my peers measure their progress. So, you know, um, poverty in Ethiopia or something. What are the metrics that all the best-in-class organizations do, and how are we doing against those metrics, and how do you, com how do you communicate that back to your donors over time? And show real progress against the social mission. That's what, I mean, if, if they're not moving the needle on the social mission that they're trying to address, like, what do they do in a way? And so I think they should be asking themselves that question as well. I don't think it's like the outsiders looking in and saying, hey, I think it's just flipping it on its head, on its head a little bit and, looking, and them looking at that as an opportunity for the next phase of growth for donations, the trust in that transparency versus a defensive reaction. Why is everyone thinking like that? Because it is public money, and I think there is a responsibility for that. I would say the transparency thing is key. We're uh, just over top of the hour, but the good news is uh, we're going to be here for you know, a little bit longer. So if you've got any other questions for Scott, feel free to come up and uh, introduce yourself and say hello. This is great. Thanks Thank so you. much. Yeah, of course. <laughs>